Hello and welcome to another Cloud Podcast, a podcast designed to bring you stories from the smartest minds in IT, operations, and business, and learn how they're using cloud technology to improve business and the customer experience. Welcome everyone to another Cloud uh, Podcast. I want to invite you guys all to, to join us on this conversation with Jakarta. Um, I'm here today, Artie Kostum. Nice to see you guys again with my co-host, Alex. Um, Alex, once again, thanks for joining and uh, welcome to the podcast. And we've yeah. got uh, Scott in Kumarin from Jakarta. Uh, welcome you two as our guests. Um, talk to us a little bit about your company and what you guys do, and then a little bit about your, yourselves first. Sure. Uh, great to be here, Artie and Alex. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Kumaran. I'm responsible for uh, solutions and marketing at Jakarta. And uh, Jakarta, for uh, those of you who may not know us, uh, we're a uh, contact center automation software company. We've been around since 1990. Uh, the company was really founded uh, on the bedrock of uh, what is today called as um, robotic process automation. Uh, that's really what we did in the first 10 years. Uh, we modernized many legacy applications and got many uh, large organizations across the globe get prepared for what used to be called the internet era back in the day. Um, and then in the early 2000s, we got into the contact center space. And there we found our new home. And uh, since that time, we really provided solutions that would simplify the employee experience uh, across the entire customer operation, starting with contact center agents all the way to frontline staff, you know, at retail stores, branches, uh, as well as uh, simplify the customer experience for customers across touch points, uh, be it on the voice uh, at an IVR or on the web or, or on a mobile application. Um, the, the neat thing about Jakarta is that we tend to harmonize our clients' existing systems, processes, and uh, channels, which typically live in silos. Um, so instead of coming in and dripping and replacing what they already have. So uh, we end up creating value pretty rapidly. Many of our deployments launch in about eight to 12 weeks and can create uh, lasting value. Hopefully that gives you some perspective. Perfect. And Scott, you wanna give us a little background on what you do and a little bit more about Jakarta? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, hey everybody, thanks Alex and Artie for uh, hosting us today. Um, Scott Merritt, um, I guess I would describe myself as a, uh, a process technologist, um, kind of grew up in the process optimization space, um, you know, working as a consultant with organizations trying to help them optimize and automate processes uh, throughout their enterprise. And then had a fortunate opportunity to jump into the technology space, sell enterprise software, um, in my past, I've competed against Jakarta, and then eventually I just had to join Jakarta. So uh, I've been at Jakarta for about two and a half years. I, I run the marketing uh, uh, team uh, globally and work uh, side by side with Kumaran to uh, you know help really tell tell organizations and communicate our value, but also really just help them optimize their contact center space through a number of methods, which I'm sure we'll uh, we'll wrap about today. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, we're often asked what we do, uh, often by people that aren't familiar with the, the contact center space, other than I know that when I call, you know, customer service on the phone, I have a great or a not so great experience. So uh, I, I often run into those conversations at parties, even with my parents who still question and wonder what I do for a living. Um, but, you know, another way to kind of think about Jakarta is, um, you know, I always go back to home automation. Uh, I know all of us have invested in the latest technologies, Alexa, we've got Google, we've got Sonos, we've got Comcast, we might have AT&T. But when it comes to turning those things on and making them all work harmoniously and together, um, you know, good luck if you don't have two or three remotes, right? And uh, good luck if your, your parents are coming over and you have to teach them how to use every one of those before they can turn on the TV for your kids. So, I don't know, I just think about, you know, what we do for contact centers and organizations is kind of similar to the, the universal remote, right? Uh, how do we integrate with all of that existing home automation technology uh, to draw a parallel there? But organizations have those same problems, right? They've bought different pieces of technology, things that are cool, things that aren't cool anymore, things that are old, 30 years, things that are brand new, new CRM system. Uh, but the fact that they don't really 
uh, integrate all of them and that shows itself uh, to the customers as they're trying to interact with that organization. We try and kind of bridge that gap and be the kind of connective tissue to, to be the universal remote for customer experience. So uh, just a different way to kind of think about uh, what we do. Um, so mm -hmm. there you have it. Two minutes or less or five. I love it. Yeah. I love and, it. And uh, Alex, well, I, I was going to say, you know, I, that's, that's a great example because the same thing happens to me. You have your Nest, you have your Sonos, then you have your Spotify app and your Alexa. And you're trying to get them all to work harmoniously. And like one's doing something over here, another one's doing something over there. And it's, it can be very challenging. And we're in technology. I can't imagine like people that aren't technically savvy that are trying to manage all of this. How did it grow from you guys being an RPA with the robotic process automation into the contact center world? How, what was that transition for the company like? And why was the move made towards contact search center versus something else? Yeah, it was. Uh, it's interesting, right? Um, the, the call center is is uh, you know could be characterized as the dumping grounds of uh, you know all the tech investments a company makes, right? You know, nobody really designs for the call center, and uh, yeah. whatever is built for finance, whatever is built for even sales and marketing, gets dumped in the call center. And unfortunately, the call center has to deal with it. And uh, which is partly why customer service has always been, uh, you know, the customer service we've all been used to as consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we found out in the early 2000s is that many of our clients were actually using our body process automation technology in the call center because they had all these disparate systems they had you know different mainframe applications that wouldn't talk to each other uh, new windows and web-based applications packaged applications that they were building at that time that wouldn't talk to each other many did you know services oriented architecture was not a thing back in the day at that time uh, and it really led to a lot of inefficiencies in the contact center. So many of our clients were actually using our individual RPA tools in the call center. So we recognized that, you know, rather than just selling a, a, a generic RPA tool to IT, why not focus on this niche? Why not focus on a, a customer operation and really help them streamline that operation by starting with, with providing integration tools, automation tools. Uh, and then the, the broader vision that we had at the time uh, which obviously evolved as the space evolved as well was to bring bring that connective tissue that that Scott was characterizing to other aspects of the customer operation, right? Because there is also a disconnect between all the digital experiences that you have, let's say on the web or on a mobile application or when you're messaging uh, and, and talking to an agent or to, an, to a chatbot and the time when you pick up the phone and come into the call center. There is another huge divide between digital and voice channels. As much as uh, there are uh, there are silos within the business systems that people work with. So, so we, are, we see our role as uh, somebody who can come in, uh, not with uh, any, any conflict of interest. Right? Usually when, when a company comes in, they, they come in to be, become the CRM at some point, become the voice platform, become the contact center platform at some point. We don't have that vested interest. We're coming in truly to just harmonize and elevate the experience. Uh, so that way we can come in, we can create value rapidly. And then it'll, it can also be sustainable value because uh, you know, we can always provide that abstraction layer, if you will, uh, which can live on as you change your backend systems, as you change your, your front end channels, so on and so forth. Yeah, and, I think. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. No, I, I was just going to say, I think from a process perspective too, as you, as you look at RPA and you go across an enterprise, right? Um, you know, robots love repetition and they love high volume interactions and transactions so that when you, you know, you build a bot, you build an automation and you deploy it, you know, you want something that's repeatable and very high volume. So you build one and you impact thousands, millions of transactions. You know, I think the big struggle for RPA, kind of as it's known in its new acronym here in the last five years, was it was a lot of back office automation. And, and while there's ugly processes, there's disparate technologies, right? All the things that you find in a contact center, the volume isn't there. You might find 50 people in the back office doing 100 different things in a day, right? So you automatically kind of gravitate to the contact center, at least we did, you know, 10, 15 years ago because you not only have you know, 60 calls a day and of those 60 calls per agent, 30 of them may be doing similar things, 
but you also have, you know, multiply it by 6,000 agents. So, you know, saving five seconds, 10 seconds with an automation or guiding them through a, a flow, the value of kind of the multiplier, right? You can exponentially bring value to organizations just, you know, five seconds or a second in a call center, um, you know, can bring huge value in a quick ROI versus trying to automate, you know, 10 things that 20 people do. So, um, you know, I think all the things that Kumaran talked about and this kind of value multiplier that you get when you when you impact agents in this high transaction environment. And you guys talked a lot about uh, efficiency gains and, you know, that comes as an ROI on the agent side. And um, I, I just pull up your website and the first thing I, I see, which is an amazing uh, kind of stat or, or proof concept here, it says, Jakarta cuts agent onboarding time by 75% and reduces errors by 90%. Start with the agent assist, most trusted by customer operations leader at Fortune 500 Enterprises. So there's a lot to digest in just those two sentences alone. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you guys address um, onboarding. How do you? How does your product support um, onboarding? Because that's that's huge for contact centers. There's always high churn and turnover and we're always onboarding new people, even if it's just to keep the same amount of headcount. So how do you guys help with that? And then also, can you guys talk a little bit about what agent assist is? And I, during the onboarding process, I'm sure it's there, but also for people who are tenured, um, what's that agent assist type ecosystem and product? That's a great question. And, and onboarding, especially over the last year, RD, I'm sure you're very familiar with this as well, that it's becoming a, a bigger challenge, right? As it is, the, the call center has been an environment where you've got this revolving door where people come in, they get trained, they're there for a few months and then they leave. Um, and a few years ago, people were saying, you know, millennials don't wanna put up with all these legacy systems and they don't wanna invest the time in training. They have, you know, don't have the patience to kind of go through this. Uh, and now it's, oh no, it's not just the millennials, it's the pandemic, now it's harder to train people. At the end of the day, the bottom line is it's a very difficult job for anybody. It doesn't matter which generation you belong to and it's hard to retain people and it's a very stressful job as well, right? Um, and, you know, nobody really, again, designs for the call center, nobody tries to it hardly gets the priority that it deserves in terms of, you know, how do you really improve that experience and how do you make, and then how do you make it a more productive experience? Everybody wants to talk about how do I drive efficiencies? How do I make it more productive? How, how do I few, you know, squeeze a few more seconds? But as we are trying to squeeze a few more seconds out of, out of that call, we're not recognizing that it is all that complexity, all that bad experience that poor experience uh, that these agents have that's actually driving that agent agent uh, turnover that's also driving that error rate that's driving customer churn it's it's really the root cause mm -hmm. so so our view is that rather than trying to optimize onboarding with some magic to magical tool or optimize coaching with some ai why don't you focus on that interaction between that customer and that agent and make that a no brainer so that the agent will learn as they're doing their jobs, right? If the experience can be so simple that it is already instructive, I don't need to go to classroom training. I don't need micro learning between my calls, right? It doesn't matter whether the training is virtualized or not. It doesn't matter whether you're using AI for my coaching but you're helping me while I'm doing that job. So the next time I get the same call, guess what? I'm going to be more proficient and I'm more likely to, to not literally cry between phone calls. We've been mm -hmm. doing a lot of research, looking at how agents really feel and, and what challenges that they've been running into over the last year. And uh, some of these stories that they tell us is really disheartening. And um, uh, anyway, so it really comes back to, so agent assist in a nutshell for us is basically a tool, a friend, uh, uh, an assistant that will guide this agent through the jobs that they need to do during the interaction in real time. And it will use RPA or automation if needed. It will use AI, you know, real time uh, voice-based guidance and things like that if needed. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about providing that guided experience so that at the end of each call, you know, I'm a little bit more knowledgeable. I'm a little bit more effective in making similar, in handling similar interactions. Yeah. One, one thing that you brought up that I thought was interesting, I think a lot of the listeners and you know viewers would want to know and just understand better is you talk about the agents, you know, what agents are experiencing and what they're frustrated about, what's challenging about their job. Like, what would you say are like top three things that people that are managing contact centers should know? Like, hey, your agents might be experiencing X, Y, and Z. Like, what, what are those? And what are you guys doing to, you know, some examples on how to fix those issues? Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure we're loaded with them. <laughs> the number of hours Coomer and I have spent shadowing agents or you know talking with uh, with customers, it's it's uh, it's in the thousands, I'm sure. But um, you know, a lot of those pains of old are the same pains, right? Which is why you know there's so much opportunity here. And you know, with some of the the survey work we've done with agents lately, um, you know, still expose a lot of those same problems and. You know, honestly, it's a lot of, you know, the technology, right? Um, the technology that they have to interact with, you know, during a call, while they're on the customer, while they're supposed to be providing empathy, while that customer is often not very happy, right? Uh, we're all customers, you know, sometimes we know we've heard those people that take it out on the agent. Sometimes we're frustrated and we bring that frustration to the agent, you know, as if that's not enough to manage that, you know, interaction and conversation, now, you know, once I know what you need, I need to go do that, right? And we kind of break up a call into kind of, you know, five segments that we can talk about. But the, the big segment where there's the most opportunity to help agents is that point where, you know, yes, I can help you understand, um, you know, from the customer what they need. But there's that time that says, you know what, I need to wire, you know, money from one place to another. I need to file a complaint. As soon as that intent is known as an agent now, I'm, that's my, you know, on hold moment, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on hold and now I got to go do something. I have to go execute. I have to log in. I have to navigate through 10 systems. Uh, a lot of them don't integrate. Some may have timed out before. I got to re-log into them. And that, all the while, I'm probably hearing about your bad day. I'm hearing about another problem you've had. I'm hearing about a bad channel interaction you may have had, right? Um, so I'm trying to listen to all that while I'm typing and trying to make this call as streamlined as possible. So I think number one is just, you know, the technology burden that we bring on to agents unintentionally, right? You know, we try and give the organization good tools, but ultimately, as Kumaran said, what ends up is kind of this, um, you know, potpourri of applications that weren't ever built for that agent. They're just tools that they end up using that help the enterprise in some way, maybe to upsell, um, you know, maybe to log in, single sign on, maybe to do different things, but not necessarily this is an application we're building for the agent. So, um, you know, I think that's the number one pain point that we see and that impacts handle time It impacts training and, uh, you know, the onboarding already you asked about, right? Most of onboarding is about how I navigate through this labyrinth of technology and understand these processes, right. not necessarily on interacting with customers. Um, yep. You know, that kind of comes after once you have that real world experience and you start, you know, playing back calls for agents, you know, that's kind of the, the piece that that's probably what we should be training on, not the technology that should be as intuitive as anything. Right. Uh, yeah. but that's, I'd say that's number one, Cameron probably has another one, another close second, I, I would imagine. Yeah. And uh, I want to drill into that a, a little bit. Um, so when we're talking about the agent and this Scott, this one might be for you. I, I don't know who's best to field this one, but when we're talking about contact center and automation, there's oftentimes the fear of the agent um, not wanting their job to be automated for a couple of reasons. One is, oh no, I'm going to lose my job or they're going to need less of us. So I might be out my job. Um, and there's also the fear of, I'm really good at doing these kind of mundane swivel chair activities. And that's what makes you know, me uh, a need for the team. Mm -hmm. And if they automate all these kind of processes where I'm really efficient at kind of doing them myself, it's going to be, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be the best because I'm not, maybe I don't have a great, um, you know, customer voice or I'm not very empathetic and I don't score very high in those kind of customer service uh, degrees, but I actually score really high in documentation, leaving notes and being able to pull up an account appropriately, those types of things. So how, um, how do you guys 
um, help your customers through those kind of roadblocks or I guess um, rumors uh, before they they try to implement something um, like your tool? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. That's that's always the that's often the the perceived threat, uh, and you know, more so maybe in some of the back office work where you're truly trying to offload full tasks, you know, from people, you know, the daily journal entries that they do, you know, document processing, things like that. You know, every shadow experience that we have, though, where we sit with agents and we spend a day, day and a half, kind of just watching and listening and learning. You know, the first thing you do is, hey, you introduce yourself and you say, I'm, I'm here to make all of this stuff work smarter for you, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, okay, you can sound like a classic consultant right from the start, right? But after you kind of watch and, you know, you spend an hour, two hours, and then you play back to them, you know, hey, wouldn't that be nice if that system took this information and logged in for you and automatically popped that customer's account and then brought forward the notes from the last five calls, right? Wouldn't that be nice thing to have? And they're just, you know, wow, absolutely, right? You know, so very quickly just engaging with the agents and asking them, right? What are the 10 things that you, you know, if you wave the magic wand, what do you wish your systems would do? What's really painful? Why do you put customers on hold? Um, And they quickly become part of that process. But that's the key point, right? Like you have to engage them in the process. Um, They have to be a part of it. They have to, you know, they'll go out and sell this for you and they'll go find more opportunities. Uh, What you don't want to do, which has happened a lot of time, right, with application development is slap an application on their desktop. Nobody's consulted. Nobody's talked about. And, you know, here, go get it. Here's a training manual. So, um, you know, all the all the things that we do, it's very it's very iterative. Uh, The agents are part of the process. The trainer is part of the process because they all can point to you where those those main pain points are. So very quickly, you can kind of overcome that hurdle, especially in the contact center. Um, and then as you do that, right, you start to bring value and then come up with more ideas. Um, but it's not just automation. I think, you know, even the greatest automation I've seen, we, we've done something where you can take, let's say, handle time or a process from eight minutes to, let's say, two minutes. Uh, but if they don't press that button or if they don't interact with that UI, they may just do what you're saying. That, hey, I'm comfortable doing this. This is my documentation. I've been here for 20 years. You know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm going to do this. So it's more than just the automation. There's guidance. There's kind of the user experience, right? Just like you design an application, uh, uh, an app, self-service app, you have to think about the agent and how best to kind of Mm-hmm. navigate them through their experience with their application. So, you know, you can't just throw a robot on the desktop and hope that, you know, adoption will be great. It's just, uh, they really have to be integral and you got to think about some of those other pieces, so. Yeah, and the, the other operational element to add on to that is is also, so today if we look at average attrition rates, right? It's pretty high. So call centers are constantly losing people as they are hiring and training them. So, the first place where you would see the benefit of automation is you wouldn't have to do so much of this this mindless hiring training, mm-hmm. and then all, the, all those engagement, pro, all those uh, enablement and engagement programs, gamification, and all of that, uh, in the hopes that you know that's somehow going to keep people in in these uh, jobs that are so difficult to to, to kind of do eight hours a day. Um, so, so number one for those who want to do this work. You know, you can make it more enjoyable. Uh, I use that word very cautiously <laughs> uh, because it is a very tough job. Yeah. Uh, and for those which and 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 the efficiencies you gain uh, will keep you from having to constantly keep hiring because you'll be able to reduce attrition. You know, typically we see, uh, of course, you know, reducing attrition is a function of many things. So we wouldn't like we don't want to take credit for all of the attrition reduction that we see in many of our deployments, but that's usually a pretty big strategic benefit for our clients. And so that's going to have a, uh, have a downstream impact on not having to rehire so much. And then we also see businesses that are constantly looking for more capacity. They want to allocate that headcount towards maybe sales, maybe retentions, you know, maybe a new product line, right? And, and the other thing we are also seeing is, I think, I think it was last year or this year, in Gartner's prediction of uh, you know, the overall call center market size, they said that the agent count is actually going up this year, uh, which is actually a change in the, uh, in the other direction. 
And we see that it's not just the pandemic that's driving it, it's also the complexity. As, as the whole idea of doing business, providing customer service becomes more complicated. Uh, consumers, you know, young and old, uh, coming from different demographics, are still reaching out to the contact center when they need help that they cannot resolve by themselves, right? So, so there is really a need to add more headcount. So it's not like your call center is going to become, you know, one tenth the size that you are operating at right now, but you know, it gives you more elasticity and, and uh, hopefully a better potential to grow. Hey guys, yeah. didn't we didn't we didn't we make a wager at the beginning who would have the first work from home um, uh, interaction or interruption? Uh, so uh, I owe you guys the money. So just okay. uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll grab it. My uh, my dog was barking a little bit earlier too. I had to go on mute because they were uh, the mailman came That's in. Funny, of course. We well the other one of our guests too. Hi, I think it was like a Great Dane, some huge dog, just like <laughs> throwing out some big barks. Um, you know, Scott, you were mentioning earlier about all these disparate systems and it, and it made me think of uh, AT&T. We've worked a lot with AT&T just on the telecom side and how they've gone through so many acquisitions and they have so many different systems for, for their agents or for even sales reps, even to the customer, customer service side that they don't know one in from the other because there's so many systems that they're trying to integrate. And I can see how as the, the bigger the organization gets, the more complex things can become, especially if they're in merger and acquisition mode and how to get those systems talking to each other. How do you see with the, your larger clients then working within that environment of, hey, we've just bought another company that has 500 employees. How do we get this all to work together? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, those are typically, uh, you know, prospects of ours that, uh, that that we look at and that, that we get insight and questions from, right, is anytime one of those acquisitions happens, you know, we know that that you'll integrate the most important pieces, right? You'll, you'll make sure that the business works. You'll make sure that financially the P&L makes sense, right? You want to make sure all of those key components are set. The agents, right, coming back to, you know, what gets left on the agent's desktop is exactly what you're saying. And, and this is not, okay, AT&T acquired this group and, you know, now we have one more application. Um, I've worked with a, a bank in the Southeast here. You know, when they look at their architecture, they, they manage, IT will manage up to 350 applications across the enterprise, you know. So imagine acquiring that kind of, you know, technology debt, right, as you onboard a, a new organization. It's, it's unbelievable. Now, you know, that's not saying 350 applications end up on a customer service desktop, uh, but typically, you know, we talk to customers in, in a couple different ways on how to use, you know, maybe it's RPA, maybe it's automation, intelligent automation, whatever. Um, but when there is that acquisition, there's going to be a time, kind of a transition period where you say, look, I'm not going to have APIs. I'm not going to be able to integrate. Uh, my only option is to give this, you know, uh, this training manager a big document of how these new systems work and, you know, how to perform a particular transaction. And now I've got to go through training and training and more training. Um, so there's a great, you know, use case in there for automation to say, look, you know, a lot of those steps, they're all just, they're all business rule driven, right? They're not asking the, the agent for, you know, their discretion. They don't have to make just some, some decision based upon, you know, human discretion. This is, these are business rule driven. Uh, and that's all these training manuals are in most cases, right? Um, so tremendous opportunity for RPA and automation to help organizations transition. And that might not be a, you know, a long-term solution. It might be six months. Uh, some of those, are, sometimes those are the best use cases where you can build a couple bots, integrate these systems, mm -hmm. uh, give IT six months of, of leeway, right? As they kind of build, uh, build those systems together and drive the APIs and integration that you need. And then, RPA will take kind of another form on top of those applications. So, uh, you know, I think you always have to be evolving in this whole agile DevOps world that we're in now. It's, it's critical towards, you know, letting automation, helping automation scale and be successful. But um, I, I would say some of my, the largest customers that we've worked with have been, you know, post acquisition. Um, and some of the biggest accounts that you lose or sales cycles that you lose are also during acquisition because, they can't think about, you know, kind of these bridge technologies, right? I know no, I need to do the big stuff, but you know, in reality, they should be thinking all of these things, right? How do I transition, but how do I kind of think long-term as well? So um, great, great question. And, and uh, you know, lots of experience in that, in that space. 
Now for, for our viewers, some of our viewers may have just a couple systems uh, that this might work for. And some of our viewers might have literally tens of systems, like 20, 30 systems. Uh, what would you recommend for the people who have a, a lot to potentially automate with RPA? Start small. Um, you know, use you guys, but start small, like maybe do a screen pop first and then add on to that later and do iterations or try to tackle as much as possible right out of the gate um, and try to automate as much as possible so that it's a, a training session for all the historical agents. You know, this is the new way to do it. And this is what it's going to look like as a as a version one or version two. What, what do you guys recommend? I think you, you already made a, a lot of good points there already. I would start from the end. Uh, you, you mentioned, I think it's important to give the agents a, a good view into what this new experience could look like. Because, uh, so let's say uh, you, you, you're looking to unify the whole desk, agent desktop and bring all the applications into one common top. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do that overnight, right? Um, but let's say you want to provide, uh, you want to start by providing some kind of a site tape to your agent, right? So they can, there's a little bit of a, a virtual assistant, if you will, on the desktop for them. They can help them, uh, you know, push information into systems, read information from systems, provide some guidance along the way, help them uh, from making, uh, prevent them from making any mistakes when they're going through a pretty tedious process, things like that, right? It's important to nail down that new experience and get the agents uh, to understand what this new experience is, what is this assistant, how does it work with the rest of their applications on the desktop. And uh, you, you also want to make it a very non-invasive experience so that it doesn't significantly disrupt their current experience on the desktop. It is seen more as a, a, a simple add-on and it'll come in and it'll help them where needed and then it'll step aside during other times. And if you design for that minimal footprint on the desktop, um, you can you still want to tackle a meaningful use case in your first deployment, right? And you can make this about a certain call type, which is already a high volume call type, for instance. And then you can say, all right, of this call type, you know, let's say I'm getting a million, million of these and each of these takes about six minutes. At six million minutes, maybe I'll, take one minute away, right? That's quite a bit of savings and just in terms of AHD. Mm -hmm. Not talking about error reduction and other kinds of benefits, first contact resolution that can come out of how well that call is handled and things like that, right? So you could still do that by just going after one use case, but you wanna nail that user experience so that after that first deployment, and that could go into production in four weeks and 12 weeks. But once that's done, you, you've set the foundation to add on more and more use cases. On an ongoing basis, um, so and and you, we also you know try not to be disruptive to the operation, um, and and really from a change management standpoint, uh, it should be very lightweight. No one should have to get trained on this new new user experience, right? The whole idea here is to train on you know learn on the go, uh, so it, it shouldn't require significant training. It shouldn't require uh, you know you, you want to bring them into the change management process into the design experience up front uh, and all of that, but you, do, you don't want to make it too heavy, too difficult for them to adopt this new experience. Sounds good. Uh, well, so, Alex, I was going to say real quick, one, one, of my, one of my favorite use cases that kind of we build into that non-invasive environment is uh, we call it kind of auto notes, right? Um, so, you know, you think about an agent working through a call with a customer for six minutes, seven minutes, three minutes, they're making changes, they're entering data. And they basically just told the computer over six minutes what it needs to do and what it needs to learn. And so now how crazy is it, right, that they're going to hang up the call and spend another, you know, minute, two minutes telling the computer again what they just did on the computer, right? So, you know, just, it, it seems really simple, uh, right? Kind of that fix, but uh, it is, right? With automation. So why not uh, tell the computer uh, to take notes or tell the robot to take notes uh, as you're navigating through those applications, what the data was before I changed the address from here to here, uh, what the case number is, and just that, you know, that 
copy paste yellow notepad, electronic notepad that you know agents usually take all the notes on. You know that all goes away, and you get consistency in notes for the pre, for the next rep that takes a call, and you get basically all the information that you need uh, in that uh, in that process. And so all the agent has to do is say, "Yep, all that looks good. Yeah, I did those five transactions. Type a couple extra notes, and then I'm off to the next call." Um, so that's a you know you don't do that for every single call type, but like Goodman said, pick three of your top call types. And, uh, you know, just implement auto notes for it. And, uh, you know, the after call work there is huge. And that's huge, you know, uh, rally cry for agents when you can reduce their auto call work uh, that they need to do. So, you know, another one that kind of gives you the, the go ahead and gets them engaged and excited about, you know, kind of what automation can bring to their day. So uh, just one, one, one example that's always a, a first implementation any, anywhere you go. So yeah, I, I used to be an agent. I used to take calls um, for a, a technology company. So it was a, it was a tech support team. Mm-hmm. And um, I always laughed at the, the like novels of notes. Um, like an agent had a three minute call and they wrote literally like a page and a half of notes. And I'd have to read through all of the detail to get this one little tidbit out of it, which exactly. you know, it didn't yeah. really make sense to do that. So um yeah, I, I love auto notation. I also love the idea of, um, you know, n- highlighting things that were changed by the agent. Like maybe they like canceled an account or updated right. billing address. Mm-hmm. The agent doesn't have to type that out. Like the system already knows that it happened. Just type it out for them. Something like, you know, my initials and then changed uh, billing address, you know, and then the date, time and date stamp. Like that's, that's pretty yeah. simple stuff that a human shouldn't have to use mental human power to, to yeah. type out. And think about that now, like what if you have, you know, 12 interactions with this customer and you have that robot that kind of delivered consistent notes. The next step then is say, okay, AI, now you can come in and start learning from that data and suggest, you know, okay, wow, AI just scrubbed through, you know, 40 lines of mainframe notes, for example. Now, AI is going to recommend to that agent, hey, really sorry, you had a bad experience. You know, I know this is the 10th time you've called in three days. Uh, Let me offer you a 10% uh, cut on your monthly bill, right? So even though there's automated notes, that still may take the next agent a long time to kind of peruse through those notes and kind of come up with a scenario while they're listening to the customer rant. Um, So that's where next, right? If you have that consistency, then let's layer on some of the uh, the AI components on here to really do some some true processing of language, and then you know next best action, next best idea. So just you know you just keep building and building and building. Sorry, Alex, go ahead, but uh, just want to throw that in. Ask you know one of the things I like to find out from providers that we work with and similar to yourselves is like, where, like, what would you say your niche is? Like where, like is the sweet spot for where you guys fit in really well, whether it's SMB, probably not, but like mid market enterprise, is there certain industries that you fall really well into? Yeah, go ahead, come runner. We'll, we'll both tackle it, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we tend to create a lot of value uh, wherever our clients are struggling with a lot of complexity. Mm-hmm. And the complexity comes in all forms and sizes, right? Uh, you, could, you could be running a, a call center with 50 agents, but uh, perhaps your complexity is in terms of the, the complex uh, sales conversation that you're having with them, right? Um, so, you know, you may be, your agents need to handle objections and rebuttals and they need to be at the top of their game as they do that. They need to come across as trusted advisors, if not, no one's going to buy. And that could be a small call center uh, where we can create value in, in allowing our uh, clients, the operations leaders to really build playbooks for their call center agents, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so that th- these playbooks then take the form of an agent assist, which will kind of, kind of guide them during that conversation in a very fluid manner. So that it doesn't sound like scripting, but it is actually, you know, for lack of a better term, it is scripted. Uh, surprise, surprise. So that's that's one end. And then on the other hand, uh, you know, the scenarios we've been talking about here, you've got a lot of applications, you've got a lot of processes, regulated processes, uh, applications that don't connect, channels, communication channels, like voice and chat and messaging that don't connect. Uh, and then you need to bring everything together so that the agent or the customer don't have to repeat the same things over and over again. So that's another classic form of complexity, as we all know. Uh, so that's that's on the other end. So 
If we look at industries, uh, again, the usual suspects are good customers for us. Uh, everybody in banking, financial services, insurance, uh, we've got a lot of customers in telco, tel telecommunications, uh, technology, uh, travel hospitality as well, especially online travel agencies uh, who are, again, not just booking a hotel or booking an airline, but they're booking these big packages. And then if you need to make a change, then it's a lot of fun. It's a long call. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of mistakes can happen along the way too, right? So um, in health insurance companies, we don't work that much with the, with the government. It's more of a go-to-market priority for us or, or lack thereof. But uh, usually when it comes to B2C or B2B2C, it's uh, you know, wherever you've got any form of complexity, uh, we, we can create some value. Uh, I always, you know, you always... I always say there's there's never been a desktop I don't like, right? Regardless of of industry, I mean, honestly, it's just a matter of you know, kind of what what area that you're attacking. To Kimberly's point, you know, government isn't a focus, but there's tremendous opportunity in in government, right? Um, you know, small medium is is not necessarily kind of a focus, but there's tons of automation opportunities. So, it's really about kind of you know finding those niches um, and you know understanding kind of where maybe those acquisitions are. Uh, you know, where those pain points might be surfacing that are truly kind of burning platforms. Uh, and BPOs, that was another one where, you know, we, we work a lot with BPOs. I mean, you think about a BPO is acting on behalf of uh, a client, right, and using their applications to serve their customers, their, their customers' customers. And so they don't traditionally have control over them, right? Um, so, you know, if I'm a BPO, I'll say, all right, Verizon, I'll, I'll answer calls for you, you know, these 12 different types of calls, but, you know, they can't change those applications. They inherit the technology debt with that implementation. And so they can kind of bring in, um, you know, RPA agent assist to then sit on top of those applications and almost play puppet master as if they're Verizon, right? And they can automate and they can provide guidance flows on top of those applications, even though they don't own any of the code, they don't have any APIs to them. And that's really the power of, of, uh, of RPA and some of the intelligent automation that we're using is you can kind of help give control over applications, surface level control over applications for companies like BPOs uh, and allow them to kind of provide better services for their customers and be more competitive with bids. So, um, you know, there's, there's opportunities everywhere. It's just, uh, <laughs> You know, how they line up. Well, perfect. Well, Scott and Kumaran, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. We uh, unfortunately ran out of time. I, we could talk about this topic forever. I think we learned a lot about uh, onboarding and the agent experience and robotic process automation. We all know that happy agents really uh, turn into happy customers. It's a the one to one effect. Um, we want to thank you guys for joining us today. Um, for those who are listening, it's Jakada. It's J-A-C-A-D-A.com. And um, check out the product. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to them directly or reach out to Alex and myself, and we'll point you in the, in the right direction. But uh, great having you on the show. And Alex, great having you as a co-host, as always. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it for having us. Thanks. You got it. Well, that wraps up the show for today. Thanks for joining. And don't forget to join us next week as we bring another guest in to talk about the trends around cloud contact center and customer experience. Also, you can find us at AdlerAdvisors.com, LinkedIn, or your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week on another cloud podcast.